Hi Paul, my name Marco. is Martin. Today I would like to ask you several questions regarding Zinzino. Um, can I ask you, can we treat Zinzino as supplements? Hmm. Or is it not a good name for it? Well, not exactly. Hmm. We're, we're outside the classical or the traditional world of supplements. I have to say that supplement industry is not one that I'm very fond of. Mm -hmm. It has not been successful. Um, really by any, uh, any metric other than the financial one. They, they're worth a good deal of money. The largest yes. sectors are fish oil and multivitamins and then minerals. And what we know is, because these types of formulations have been tested repeatedly, uh, that they confer no benefits whatsoever. So on the whole, I don't think much of supplements. We're not pharmaceuticals either, we're not food, we're a new category. Mm -hmm. And the term that is most often used to describe what it is that we're doing is pharmaconutrition. Mm -hmm. Thank you for this. And what is the most important, unique indicator in our test uh, as a tool in personalized supplementation? Is there one that you would underline the most? Well, it's a dynamic picture. It is changing uh, all the time. Uh -huh. The test that we initially used uh, is a dried blood spot technology, DBS technology, and we use this to measure the, uh, the dozen or so most important lipids that are present uh, in your uh, blood and in your cell membranes. And from that we can derive uh, initially the omega-3 index and the 6 to 3 ratio, which of course is important in the temperate zones in determining your propensity to chronic inflammatory stress. Um, and we can measure a couple of other things, algorithms that we mm -hmm. use, uh, which to be honest I'm not as confident about. I think you know there is something in them. We can measure something like cell flu uh, membrane fluidity, mm -hmm. which is determined by the ratio of highly unsaturated fatty acids to saturated fatty acids in the cell membrane. And from that, we can also derive another algorithm which looks at something rather anomalously called mental strength. Mm -hmm. I, I don't put as much weight on those algorithms. I prefer to remain uh, on more solid scientific ground with the omega-3 index and the 6 to 3 ratio. Thank you for this. Mm -hmm. And what about our Xenoshine vitamin D3? Why is it that effective? Because uh, in the market there are also some other types of vitamin D3, mm. in, for instance, in, for, in the form of drops, yeah. etc. And how we can uh, refer D3 in, in, in relation to necessary mm. cofactors like vitamin K2 or magnesium? Well, first of all, hypovitaminosis D is very, very common. Mm -hmm. And it's common not only in the temperate zones, because we simply don't get that much sunlight, yeah. uh, but even in the, in the uh, subtropical zones, because the governments have spent so much time warning us about the dangers of sunlight. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of that advice is really badly misconceived. It's a lot, big, complicated story behind that. So vitamin D supplements are increasingly widely recommended by the medical profession. I think there is a good justification for them. <clears throat> it's not, I think, a very good idea to use a monotherapeutic approach when it comes to supplementation. So if you're already taking the health protocol, then adding Vitashine to that, adding vitamin D to that, I think is absolutely fine. If you're using it as a standalone, you do really need other cofactors. And so, um, K2 is important for some applications, magnesium, magnesium is important. Uh, but again, I, I don't really, using single vitamins or even small, uh, relatively arbitrary groups of micronutrients on their own, I would rather place this in the context of a pharmaconutritional program. Thank you very much. So it's better to treat it more holistically, for instance, in extent, when we have a lot of macro micronutrients, than to take the... Well, I would prefer to do that. I would prefer to do that. And the reason is this whole idea of monotherapy or oligotherapy is simply not appropriate to nutrition. It's an idea that we've borrowed from the pharmaceutical industry. Mm -hmm. And it's actually, in many cases, it's inappropriate in that industry. It's certainly inappropriate when it comes to ours. Having said that, Vitashine is interesting in some other respects because it is a vitamin D that is derived uh, from um, lichen. Mm -hmm. So this is not from an animal form at all, it's vegan D3. And of course, for a lot of people today, that, that in itself is important.
Mm -hmm. and you mentioned vegan, and there are cer certain people who are following um, specific diets, for instance, yeah. vegan diet or keto diet. And are there any um, deficiencies <coughs> and any supplementation that could be um, b higher in dosage, for instance, for this kind of um, diet? Uh, well, I think definitely, yes. I mean, if you're vegan, you're probably going to have problems with things like B12 and like carnitine. You know, there are well-established uh, issues that, that go along with that. And this is probably, um, and, and, and the long-chain omega-3s, of course, ah, long chain. if, if mm -hmm. you're a vegan. Unless, of course, you're eating lots of seaweed, and most vegans okay. don't. Mm -hmm. um, and that's probably one of the reasons why, although theoretically, there may be some theoretical reasons for thinking vegetarians and vegans might live longer, they don't. Actually, they don't. Ah, mm -hmm. And I think that's probably because of issues like that. Uh, if you're going to a keto diet, mm -hmm. um, it depends which version of the mm -hmm. keto diet. Because some people will say, well, we can't eat fruit mm -hmm. because of the sugars. And yeah. if you cut fruit out of your diet and um, even whole grains, which some people will also do, you're also going to run into specific phytonutrient problems. Mm -hmm. So those types of diets, I think, are more, they're, they're more uh, based on a narrative mm -hmm. rather than on pure science. Uh, I'm rather immune to narrative. I, I obsess with the science. I, I, as a trained pharmacologist, I really focus on mechanism of action. Mm -hmm. And so I don't go along with you know, the fashion for keto or carnivore or paleo. I want to know what's in it and how is that going to interact with your metabolism. And what is the end effect going to be on your health prospects? Uh, I think that's a more um, rational approach. Thank you. Thank you for this. And can you tell us, Paul, about the relation between vitamin D3 and essential fatty, a fatty acids in terms of regarding um, autoimmune diseases, for instance, Hashimoto or things like that? Well, uh, okay, that's a very complex question. Much more, even more compl I know you know it's complicated, but it's even more complicated. Yeah, okay. I think, first of all, we are beginning to develop a rather new way of thinking about autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. And the classic idea, which is that it is due to molecular mimicry. Mm -hmm. So you have an infection, and then maybe there is a, a sh molecular confirmation on the surface of the pathogen, you kill the pathogen, and now the immune system finds something similar on the surface of one of your cells, and it attacks your cells. That was the classical idea. And a lot of immunologists <coughs> now think that, that and, e and even, even in the early days, said, well, no, that's not possible. And some new research is beginning to cast a very interesting light uh, as to some other types of possible mechanisms that may be involved. It's preclinical at the moment. Mm -hmm. And basically what has been shown is that various um, microbial species, if they escape from the compartments in the body where they're normally located, and I'm talking now particularly about the colonic microbiota, mm -hmm. under certain circumstances they can escape from the colon, get into the bloodstream, find a home in other tissues. Mm -hmm. How does that relate to autoimmune disease? First of all, it's been shown in animal models to trigger autoimmune-like processes. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that if this is a microbe which is able to get into a cell, it lives intracellular, mm -hmm. and, and many of them are, it might reside in certain cells in the thyroid or in your pancreas or in the synovia around your joints. Mm -hmm. The immune system can't get to it, but as the microbe in residence replicates, fragments of that pathogen will be expressed on the cell surface. And when the immune system sees that, it's actually trying to kill the infection. Mm -hmm. But it's inside the host tissues. So the host tissue is becoming damaged as a kind of innocent bystander. Now, that might seem a little far-fetched, but one of the most interesting pieces of clinical evidence, as opposed to the preclinical model, is that there are well-recorded cases and some evidence in the literature that with some of these autoimmune diseases, Long courses of antibiotics, particularly mm -hmm. those antibiotics which are able to act inside the cells, mm -hmm. not all of them can, but the ones that can penetrate the cells, lead eventually to a cure. Mm -hmm. In terms of the classical model, there is no cure, but we're now finding that in some cases there is. Now, <clears throat> there, of course, there are problems 
associated with the very long-term use of antibiotics, very familiar problems. So we don't have to go into that. Yeah. And that is why I'm so excited about the development of a novel antibiotic, which is effectively an amplification mm -hmm. of the innate immune system. Mm -hmm. so this is the brand name. I don't, I don't even know if it's available here. Mm -hmm. um, but what we do is we take lactoperoxidase, typically from cow's milk. Mm -hmm. You stabilize that on a solid substrate. You then add to it the compounds it needs to, uh, uh, to, to do its reactive self. You've got to give it um, hypocyanocyanate, and you can give it uh, various other halogens, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and you then allow the enzyme reaction to proceed. You stop it, and it's now produced huge numbers of reactive species, mm -hmm. hypothiocyanus and hypothiocyanate ions. You drink that, and they get into every part of your body very quickly because the molecular weight is so small. Wipe out the pathogens. Do not attack your symbionts mm -hmm. because they're, they're, they, they know it. And you might do this twice a day for three days. And wow. that's the end. Super. It's, it's really, really interesting. And um, mm -hmm. we, we did one study in Hungary, an mm -hmm. open label study, um, and found that this was an extremely effective way of treating all kinds of infections. So it's, it's, it's really taking a part of your innate immune system, one of the humoral components, and amplifying it. I see, okay. But that seems to be a more interesting way, a more, and potentially more productive way of looking at the treatment of a number of autoimmune diseases. Now, is that a cure for all autoimmune diseases? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I don't think so, because I believe that some of the autoimmune diseases, for example, like Hughes syndrome, actually does look like the classical model. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's two different kinds. Maybe we have to think in terms of different types of autoimmune disease, mm -hmm. and then we can, can think of therapeutic modalities mm -hmm. corresponding to those. So I know it's a long way from vitamin D, uh -huh. and it's a long way from omega-3s, uh -huh. but I, I just felt that to answer your question properly, Thank we need to go down Thank you very much for embracing. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm sorry, inter inter because there are a lot of people who are interested um, in their health, of yeah. course, and uh, mm, let's say Hashimoto. So um, can we support them by, um, for <coughs> instance, um, health protocol or w it would be recommended also to add um, vitamin D or what would you uh, suggest? Oof. Well, I, um, we're dealing with uh, what are considered to be natural products and supplements. Yeah. They're not licensed pharmaceuticals, mm -hmm. so we cannot say that we cure anything. Mm -hmm. We can I just mean, support. Uh, you know, the regulatory system won't allow us to tell the truth. We cannot speak openly about the science, mm -hmm. and so I won't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I can say is that um, when the immune system starts to attack the target tissue, mm -hmm. whether it's the thyroid or any other uh, part of the body, it actually destroys the target through a process of chronic inflammation. I see. So if you could damp chronic inflammation, you should be able to interfere with the process mm -hmm. and the progression of the problem. Okay. Um, I have personal experience, mm -hmm. personal experience in my, of using this approach. I was diagnosed with Graves and I now don't have Graves. Super. So it looks. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and could I just say, yeah. it, it was diagnosed in all the classical ways. I was clearly hyperthyroid. Um, I had, you know, the uh, high levels of uh, thyroid hormones. I went into atrial fibrillation, my blood pressure was up, I lost lots and lots of weight, I was running a low grade oh. fever, uh -huh. I was even starting to develop exophthalmos. And then, because I, a doctor is always his own worst patient, of course. <laughs> I realized much too late what was happening, uh -huh. and I thought, okay, let's see what I can do. If I can damp the inflammatory response, maybe my immune system will forget its target. And mm -hmm. for me that worked, but I, you know, I, I can't possibly extrapolate from that, that's mm -hmm. just one case. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. And uh, for, um, regarding uh, Xenogene, particularly due to curcumin, uh, can it be recommended for preventive action and as a complementary anti-inflammatory therapy or additional to some other therapies that are simultaneously applied? Um, well, I don't think that Xenogene should be taken for long periods of time uh -huh. at the high dose. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is mm -hmm. um, we're using a very a highly bioavailable form of mm -hmm. the curcuminoid. It uses a lipisperse technology, which gives you enormous bioavailability. And the reason for that is, this was designed as a senolytic. We want to remove senescent cells, which there's a lot of evidence that says that's a pretty good thing to do. And in order to do that, we need to reach certain tissue levels. Mm -hmm. And by 
you're going for the, the, the large dose of Xenogene by taking all the tablets at once. We know from previous work done in Australia that that will get your levels up. Into the zone where we know from other studies, synolysis takes place. Um, and because the doses are so high, I just think that it would be wise. I would not recommend people to do this for more than a couple of weeks at a time. Remain in the subacute time zone. Don't go to subchronic or chronic because we just don't know. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to be conservative. We have to have a regard at all times for the safety of anyone who wants to use this type of approach. So I say two weeks. Um, and I also think that if you were using this to, uh, as a senolytic, um, I don't think this is a treatment for young people. I don't think they need it necessarily. So when is it that you start to accumulate senescent cells? When do they start to do lead to a, a, an impairment of function, whether it's musculoskeletal or mental? Mm -hmm. And nobody knows where because people act at, uh, age at different rates. But I would say as a rule of thumb, I don't think anyone below the age of 50 needs this. I see. Now, there is an exception. Mm -hmm. Always an exception. Of course. Mm -hmm. And that is if you want to use this as an aid to oral hygiene. Because ah. Xenogene also contains these very interesting polysulfated oligosaccharides, mm -hmm. so fucoidines from seaweed. And there, I think it's acceptable to use the lower dose of Xenogene just mm -hmm. to provide these fucoidines so that they're constantly in the saliva. Mm -hmm. Preventing the buildup of plaque and tartar on the teeth. A lo lower dose, for instance, like one tablet per day? Single, ta single tablet a day. Single with, tablet yeah, a day. Yeah, you don't need more than that. Mm -hmm. Thank you for this. Uh, can I also um, ask you, Paul, about a lean shake? Can it be, because mal malnutrition type B is quite common nowadays. Mm -hmm. And regarding this, there might be possible some protein deficiencies. And regarding to this, can lean shake be recommended as, um, maybe not as a meal, but something additional to a meal mm. or meal itself? I don't know how we can treat this. Um, I would say that type B malnutrition is almost universal. Universal. Uh, mm -hmm. Because thanks to our low energy physical lifestyles and, mm -hmm. and the, uh, the huge accumulation of ultra processed foods in the mm -hmm. diet which contains so many empty calories. So most people are low in most things. Mm -hmm. And scientists on both sides of the Atlantic have acknowledged this. One of the things that we're not low in is calories. Uh -huh. And I don't think very many people are very low in protein either. So the people who might want to use Lean Shake, first of all, bodybuilders mm -hmm. who actually want to add more protein. They're not depleted to begin with, but if you yeah. want more protein because you want to bulk up, that's fine. <laughs> and under those circumstances, you could add it to your dietary regime. For mm -hmm. other people, they use this as a weight loss program. Mm -hmm. And there you're using it as a meal substitute. Mm -hmm. So it's a different way of using it. It works equally well. One of the nice things about Lean mm -hmm. Shake is it has such a low glycemic index and low glycemic load. Mm -hmm. And we know this because the type 2, type 1 diabetics who've been using it tell us that it has the same impact on their insulin requirements as a green salad. In other words, almost nothing. Um, and in some situations, if you're a diabetic, of course, that's really, really useful. If you want to bulk up and you want to use this as additional protein, you might actually want to add a little bit of carbohydrate to it because having a little bit of an insulin response mm -hmm. is probably quite good in helping you to take those mm -hmm. that protein, those amino acids, and actually incorporate it. But the bodybuilders know that kind of stuff. No, they're, no. They're, they're all freaks anyway. Okay. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry to all the bodybuilders. <laughs> <laughs> Not freaks, just dedicated to your art. And now we're talking about bodybuilders, maybe can we say something about women, about pregnant and breastfeeding women, mm -hmm. and kind of how they can benefit from health protocol, or would you, Paul, recommend something in particular for women in this situation? <laughs> well, um, it's a very standard to ad advise women who are pregnant or are going to become pregnant uh, to take a folic acid supplement. I mean, this mm -hmm. is really well established. Mm -hmm. Uh, work that was done in Ireland where there was a high incidence of neural tube defects. They found that if you add folic acid, you can reduce spinal tube, you know, neural tube defects uh, mm -hmm. by a certain amount. And then if you add B6, you got a further reduction. If you add B12, you got a further reduction mm -hmm. because you're actually putting in methyl groups at different points of the cycle. Mm -hmm. So we get around that. We, 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 we resolve that by using quatrifolate, which is not affected by MTHFR. 
mm -hmm. um, which some, some people, quite a lot of people have a problem with. Other work has shown that um, by just taking in general better nutrition, you can re end up with a, a longer pregnancy, a better pregnancy, better pregnancy outcomes, less maternal depression, and better fetal and early infant development. And I've got to the point now where I can recognize um, health protocol babies. <laughs> so they come to the events sometimes and I see them sometimes when they're very young and typically um, they're very young, sometimes you know a month, a couple of months, mm -hmm. and they're sitting up there, their eyes are wide open, they're looking at things, they're, they're alert, they're interested, but you know what, they don't scream. Oh. Which is uh, quite... Um, quite disturbing. You know, you think, who are they looking at? What are they thinking of? Uh. <laughs> they're really well behaved, they're calm, they're happy, and, and they're highly alert. That's, that's um, something I've seen again and again and again. I don't know what kinds of teenagers or adults they'll grow up to be, but I think potentially very interesting ones. Wow, thank you very much. Um, just and I have just one question um, regarding because co concentration. A lot of people they have um, what I've noticed um, just after the pandemic they were alone, so they had some problems um, we, in terms of being just with themselves in, in the room, let's say. So they feel lonely, etc. And also, um, I'm talking about the um, Balance Oil uh, Premium One, the, mm. the, the, the more with the poly with the four times more po po polyphenols and could we recommend it uh, for people who have some uh, problems with um, when they feel lonely for instance or the second part of people who would like to concentrate when they are learning for instance so is there any well good heavens we don't have a cure for loneliness yeah i mean and, uh, i mean uh, I mean, that's a criticism of the way our society operates. I mean, America is a deeply lonely, very isolated society, mm -hmm. and I, yeah. I spend a lot of my time there. Um, you could say it's a feature of advanced capitalism, mm -hmm. but, but now we're, we're straying away from nutrition, we're getting into politics, which is an area I'm equally interested in. I think that um, there is quite good evidence that if, you ha if you're badly nourished, if you have the wrong 6 to 3 ratio, but a lot of the cofactors aren't there, mm -hmm. it will lead to um, in compromised or impoverished impulse control. Mm -hmm. It'll lead to reduced motivation. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll lead to a more, a, a more of a risk of anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. And you won't be able to focus on something as well as you should, you won't be able to learn or perform as well as you should. The first person who really looked at this in a very interesting way is a friend of mine called Bernard Gesch mm -hmm. with the so-called Aylesbury Prison Study and what he showed was that with um, a very early version of what, of what kind of went on to become extent, a, a much simpler version, mm -hmm. that the inmates, the um, young inmates of this prison, that they started behaving better mm -hmm. and there were less incidents of violence. Um, again, this is not a new idea. In the 19th century, the prison wardens knew all about that. They mm -hmm. knew all about the importance of good nutrition mm -hmm. in helping people to behave better. But we forgot about that. The pharmaceutical industry brushed mm -hmm. all that under the rug. And Bernard began to bring this idea back. So I think coming back to the, the core of your question, mm -hmm. what many people will tell me is that once they get onto the health protocol, that neuroinflammation is clearly stopping. The sickness behaviors associated with neuroinflammation start to fade away. Mm -hmm. We see impulse control improving. We see mood improving. We mm -hmm. see people becoming less stressed. We see performance improving in many different sectors. Um, Viva has a role to play there too, but now we're looking very specifically at neurological involvement in the VTI, in the hypothalamus, and that's a slightly different issue. Wow. Paul, thank you very much for your time. <laughs>